Good morning. Good morning. We have a good fourth. Uh, hey, we started a series last week. It's really just two parts. Uh, we did part one last week, and we'll do part two. There we go. There we go. That's what I love about you. You're not only a good-looking crowd, but you're smart. And uh, we're going to do part two today. And we've been talking about God and country. And so what I'm going to try to do is, I, I'm not going to cover everything we covered last week. But let me just kind of do it really as succinctly as, as possibly as I can. And what we said is, beginning last week, we said, within our country, there is, there's a debate, and it's multi-layered. It's, you know, Republican, Democrat. Um, it's, you know, liberal, conservative. It's national health care, no national health care. Um, it's 1%, it's 99%, whatever it is. And that's it's multifaceted. But underneath that, and it hasn't surfaced to the top, but it will. And underneath that is, is basically a debate, and there are two sides of it. On one side of it, people say, we need to include God in the talk that we have, the conversation we have about politics, and the conversation we have about law. And there are other people that say, no, God just needs to sit in the corner, and we, just, we, we can take care of ourselves. We can handle it all ourselves. We really don't need God involved in any of that. We talked about last week that we have a national conscience. We talked about, again, with, we said, we all have a personal conscience. We all know what that is. You're born with it, right? And then things get put into that, things your mama said, people told you, and you have a personal conscience. And it is the things that you ought and ought not to. The things that you go along and you say, uh, 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 no, uh, I shouldn't do that. That's an ought not to. Or you come along and you go, oh, yeah, that, that's okay. That's your conscience, right? We all have one of those. But what we don't think about is we have a collective conscience. A collective conscience as a family, a collective conscience in your business, in your organization. But we have a national collective conscience that we have. And I gave you several examples for that. I said one is, for instance, child pornography. And again, if we talk about a collective not conscious. We're not saying everybody in America, but as a whole, we would say these are the things that we would say these are you ought and you ought not to. We talk about child pornography. We say, of course, that is an ought not to, right? Well, really? Why not? Why? Because there are some places in the world that that's not an ought not to. We talked about the child labor laws. We said, well, yeah, of course, that's an ought not to for our country because we say children shouldn't be working, working in certain environments. That is an ought not to. But, it, but why? Because that's not true everywhere. In fact, we go into some places in the world and we see children working and we say that is a human rights what? Abuse. And they say, no, it's not. That's what you Americans say, but it's not what we say. But we say that is an ought not to. I gave you the illustration about trash. You have a bag of trash in your car. And how many of you would throw that out? Even if it was not against law, but how many of you going down the road would just whip that out and roll down the window and throw that out? And most of you said, no, I wouldn't. And why wouldn't you? Because it is part of our national conscience that says that's an ought not to. And the question is, why? What is it that has informed our conscience as a nation? And we said to begin with and continue on for many, many years, what informed that was this idea from our national forefathers. And we need to say is, remember, not all of them were Christians. We're not saying that. Not all of them believed that the Bible was literally God's word. But collectively, here's what they said is that we believe that these things are self-evident. Remember? That God has created, this creator has created everybody equal, the person on your right and your left, and God has given us certain rights. And from that, our conscience became between we realized we had this gratitude toward God, and we were accountable to God personally, but also corporately, nationally. And because of that, we've had this national conscience. Now, today what I'm talking about is this. Why is it that we say, well, let's, you know, let's put God to the side. Let's not put God in politics or we think about law or social justice or any of those things. Let's just put God to the side. What is it within us that causes us to do that? And the reason is, it's probably going to surprise you because for many of us, we think as well, um, it's because it makes people uncomfortable if we do that. Um, it might alienate some people or we're just smart now and we grow beyond that. But that's not the answer. 
The true answer of why we have said, God, you go sit in the corner, is because we become so affluent. Affluency and humility are not good partners. They have a tendency to contrast with one another. You know that because some of the most Islamic people you ever met are some of the most wealthy people, right? And some of you have lived long enough to see that in other people's life. Some of you have seen it in your own life, right? And what is true of an individual is true of a nation. The more things that you have, the less dependent you are upon God. You got your Bibles, take them and turn to Deuteronomy 8, chapter 6. Passage we're going to look at today, and this is going to have relevance not only for our, our nation, but for us as individuals, for your family, um, because it speaks so well to this idea about when we become more fluent, the tendency is for us is to become less dependent on God. As you're turning there, I want to read a passage of scripture because Jesus talks about this the idea of this conflict between fluency and humility. And the book of Proverbs here is a great, great, great passage of scripture. In fact, I would encourage you to do this. I would encourage you, this passage here in Proverbs, I'm going to read in just a moment. It'll be up on the screen. This is a prayer, and I would encourage you to make this the prayer of your heart. Because here's what I've seen. 99.9% .9 of the people that I have ever known in my life, and I'm 52, I'll be 53 in January. 99.9% .9 of the people I have seen, and I have known, and that I know today, Affluency and humility in their life do not mix. Jesus makes that clear in the book of Proverbs. Here's what it says. Here's a great prayer. Give me neither poverty or riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, what? Who is the Lord? Now, we as a nation publicly, politically, and nationally are saying, who is the Lord? And it's not because we're so smart, it's because we have come to a place of affluency, and when we get to that place, we have this tendency to say, well, who? Who is the Lord? Now, in Deuteronomy, here's what we're going to look at. Deuteronomy chapter 8, here's the passage. I'm going to set up for you. This nation of Israel has been out in the wilderness, I mean, just searching and searching and searching, wandering around for 40 years. They come to the promised land right at the promised land, and they're just about to enter over, and in that, God says to Moses, he's, he kind of impresses upon him this, I want you to give a speech. I want you to talk to the people before they enter into the promised land. And so Moses goes and talks to them and says, now listen, before you go into this great land of all these things and all these wonderful things, there's something you need to remember, something you need to hold on to. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 6, we go there. He says, observe the commands of the Lord your God, walking in His ways and revering Him. In other words, Moses says two things you need to remember. When you get into the land, there's law, and there is to be awe of God, reverence for God. That there is going to be, we're going to, we're going to be people of law, but we are going to be people of awe of the God who stands behind them. Now, here's the thing. Go back. If you don't trust me, go back and look at history. Go, laugh, go back and look at when this nation started. And you look at the founders and you see, here's what they did. They said, we're going to start a nation. We're not going to have a king. What we're going to do is, we are going to have a nation. And we're going to have a law and laws in it. And we are going to have an awe and a reverence for the God, the creator, who stands behind that law. Exactly the same thing. Now, it goes on in verse 7. He says this, For the Lord your God is bringing you into all this good land. We're going to skip throughout part of this passage here. And he's going to talk about the next few verses is the, the land there and the trees and the fruit and all the things that these people are going to get to see and all they're going to enjoy. It goes down to verse 10 and says this, When you have eaten and are satisfied, praise the Lord your God for the good land he has given you. Now, when you get there, he says, don't be Forget to, to be grateful. Now, why would he say that? <clears throat> People are wandering around for 40 years, and they, they can't find food, and they're scavenging for it. They can't, and they walk in. You know, it's kind of like, you know, you walk around, and you have to eat out of a trash can for years and years and years. And then all of a sudden, 
somebody allows you to go into this restaurant with all the food in the world, and you would think the last thing in the world would, would be what? It's not grateful, right? But it is human nature not to be grateful, right? Right? <laughs> you have kids? <laughs> Grandkids? Yeah. You know how they are? They're just naturally that way. You do things for them, give things for them, and then the first words out of their mouth is, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to you. Is that it? What is it? Give me more. Feed me. Give me. You know, that's because it is not natural to be grateful. Here's what he says is, when you go in, you be grateful. Don't forget to be grateful for what you have. Verse 11. Be careful then that you don't forget the Lord your God, failing to observe His commands, His laws, His decrees that I am giving you this day. Moses knew that prosperity and humility don't work well together. And here's what he says is God is about to prosper you. And the temptation for you is to think, well, we did this by ourselves. And we don't, we're not dependent upon God anymore. The temptation is going to be not very long when you get in here is to say, who is the Lord? Who, who is the Lord? Because look at all that we've got. Look at all that we've done. Look at all that we've accomplished. Look how hard that I've worked. Look at the education that I've got. Verse 12. Otherwise, when you eat or you're satisfied, when you build fine houses and settle down, and when your herds and flocks grow large, that means when your garage is full and you don't know, get so much stuff, you know, you're in a storage unit, your silver and gold increase, stock goes up, um, all you have is multiplied. Then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. In other words, he says, when things are going well, the tendency for us is to say what? Look what I pulled off. Look what I did. Look at, you know, I worked hard, I saved, we made good investments, and I got a good education. Who is the Lord? Who is the Lord? Verse 17. You may say to yourself, my power and the strengths of my hands have produced this wealth for who? Who? For me. Now listen, this is important. This applies to nations, it applies to individuals. When you and I get to the point where we think as a individuals or nations or whatever it may be, when we get to the point where we think is, I've accomplished all this and I've done it through my own hands. When we get to that point is, we have no accountability to anybody except for ourselves. And when we get to that point is, we feel like we have no accountability and there is no divine accountability, especially at that point, then what happens is the way that we treat people becomes more and more unjust. Look at history. Read history. Even Christian nations, when they forgot that they were accountable to a divine being, God, when they forgot that, their injustice was overwhelming toward other people. Because the feeling is, this thing that I have, this wealth that I have, all that, it's, it's for me. And justice goes out the window. That's why in our society, free enterprise, capitalism, the American way of life is awesome. It is awesome. Until we forget that we are accountable to God and grateful to Him. And then it becomes just an excuse for hoarding injustice. And the problem is not the system. The problem is our heart, we're no longer accountable. We're no longer grateful to God. Now, I could get off on a rant on that. But just think over the past few years, the past recession that we've been in, and all the injustice that happened toward us people. And it's not because of the, the system we have. It's because we thought, hey, we're not accountable to anybody. And we're not grateful to anybody. And when that happens, injustice runs rampant. Toward other people. Verse 18 says this, but you remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the, what's the word there? The ability to produce wealth. He gives you. Now, if any other nation, listen, if any other nation in the world, we, it ought to be us. Think about this. Think about today the land mass that we control. Think about the resources that we control. 
Think about the population that we control. Think about on the East Coast and the West Coast that we are defended by seas and oceans. To the North is not very good climate. To the South is not very good climate. Now, where were we when that took place? <laughs> Who picked that spot out for us? Oh, it was us. Yeah, we're really, yeah. That was us. Sure. But you see, who gives us the ability? God. Verse 19. If you ever forget the Lord your God and follow other gods and worship and bow down to them, I testify against you today that you will surely be destroyed. Now, when you read that, you might think, I'm glad we're not in Israel. Because this was given to the nation of Israel. And so we're like, man, I'm glad we're not the nation of Israel because we don't have this covenant thing with God like Israel had where it was cause and effect and, you know, you do those things. And because God said, Israel, if you blow this, if you go into this place and you forget that you're, you're, you're grateful to me, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to destroy you. And you look at history and guess what happens? God destroyed you. Verse 20. Goes on, finishes it up. Last, last one we'll read. Like the nations the Lord destroyed before you, so you'll be destroyed for not even obeying the Lord your God. Now you say, Craig, do you think, do you think that, that that nations that forget God, that God destroys them? I don't know. But maybe it doesn't take an overt action of God when a nation forgets God and God, you know, they just kind of push God to the side. Maybe it's just the cause and effect. Maybe it's just the sowing and the reaping that eventually happens. But God says to Israel, listen, those other nations that I didn't have a covenant with and they did this, if you forget this, it's, <laughs> it's going to be the end for you. I'm going to destroy you. Now, listen, it does not have to be that way in our country. We do not have to say, God, you go sit in the corner. We'll figure it out. We've got it. We'll take care of it. And the reason why I know that is because that's not the way our country started. And it's not that been that long ago to where our country didn't operate that way. There was a time and a place where we realized is that God was the one we're grateful to. And he is the one that we are accountable to. How many of you remember uh, when D-Day was? When was D-Day? June 6th, what? When? 1944. There you go. 1944. Uh, Steve Ambrose wrote a book called D-Day, and in it he outlines the things that happened leading up to D-Day, and he outlines just he documents all that so we know that it's really true. And what he talks about is that we know what happened with D-Day is the Germans had invaded France, and so what we decided is as a country is we have got to invade France. We're going to push the Germans back into Germany. And everybody in the United States knew it. Everybody knew it. And not only that, the Germans knew it. But the problem is, they didn't know the day and the time that we were going to do that and where we were going to do that. But on June 6, 1944, we started D-Day, the invasion. Then. And what happened on that day is, I want to read for you, he talks about some of the things leading up to that, some things that happened. It's because the president we had at that time had a prayer that he gave publicly on the national radio. Now, think about this for just a moment. We had 130,000 troops that we had trained. They were ready to go. They were ready to go in on D-Day. They were all prepared. 250,000 people that supported that through different military bases and backgrounds all around the nation and around the world. So we were all ready to go in. This was the greatest military thing that never happened probably in the history of the world so far and the enemy didn't know it and that day though of a president who didn't say hey we got a great military we got a plan we got it prepared we're ready who's the lord what we don't who's the lord we don't need to factor god into this Instead, President Franklin Roosevelt gave a prayer over the power, over the power of the radio, and that was a national prayer. It was broadcast throughout the day, and here's what he said. I'll think about this for just a moment, because people, I'm, people were saying at that time, some people were saying, why do we need to pray? Why do we need to factor God into this? We plan, we prepare, we train. Here's what he says. Almighty God, 
our sons, pride of our nation, have set apart on this day a mighty endeavor. Lead them straight and true. Give strength to their arms, stoutness to their hearts, steadfastness to their faith. These men are drawn to peace, and they fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end conquest. They fight to liberate. They yearn for the end of the battle, for their return to the haven of home. Some never will return. Embrace them, Father, and receive them, heroic servants to thy kingdom. And Lord, give us faith. Give us faith in thee, faith in our sons, faith in each other. Thy will be done, Almighty God. Now, your daily news took all their lead articles, your daily news, all their lead articles, took them down, they republished the Lord's Prayer. Lord Taylor never opened that day. 3,000 employees, the president said to them, you go home and you pray. New York Stock Exchange closed for five minutes so that everyone could pray. The editors of the New York Times took away the editorial for the next day, June 7th. Here's what they wrote, the lead line. We pray for the boys we know and for the millions of boys who are part of this invasion. We pray for our country. The cause prays for itself. For it is the cause of God who created man free and equal. Special services were held all over this country, in synagogues, in churches, and people were just packed out. Columbus, Ohio, the mayor Jim Rose ordered that at 7.30 p.m. the air raid sirens and factory whistles uh, go off. And that was a call to prayer. The city completely stops. Now, in that moment, here's what we understood. We understood, even though we have all this, we plan, we prepare, we're ready to go, we still need God. We need God. And here's the thing. Not everybody was on board on that. In fact, there was significant pushback from certain groups and certain Americans who said, nah, we don't think we should be doing some of those things. But thankfully, the American populace didn't adhere to that. Because you see, in a few years later, we would have another conflict in this country, and it was called the Civil Rights Movement. And the leader of that was not a politician. He was a, what? A pastor. Before he was Dr. King, he was what? Reverend King. And from pulpits all over this country, people said, hey, we are under the authority of God. We are appealing to the national conscience that God created us all equal, every one of us. And there was an appeal to the national conscience of this country that said, and people finally said, you know, we don't like this, this makes us uncomfortable, but what we're doing to black men and black women, it's just what we ought not to, what? To do, because it's not right. It's not right. Now, let me read you two things from his speech, famous speech that was given August 28, 1963, Lincoln Memorial. He says this, now's the time to lift our nation from the quicksand of racial injustice to the solid rock of brotherhood now is the time to make justice a reality for all of God's children. And then he said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. And you know what he quoted then? He quoted the Declaration of Independence. He's like, hey, remember, remember, remember that, that was the compass point for us? And that when we started, we it's like our forefathers said, hey, it may take us a long time to get there, but what we realize is, listen, we're going to start a nation, and that nation is basically going to be as we believe in a creator. Now, they all, like I said, they all didn't believe in God. They were all Christians. They all, didn't, they all didn't see the Bible the same way, but they said, here's what we know, and here's what we're going to build this nation upon, is that we believe in a creator, and he's made us all equal, and he has given us certain inalienable rights. Not the government, but... God. And Martin Luther said, you know what? We haven't forgotten that. 
that in the beginning, God created us all equals. Here's what he said. We hold these truths to be self-evident, self that all men are created equal. And then he closed with a line, remember? And he said it's from the Negro spiritual. Free at last. Free at last. What's the next three words? Thank God Almighty. Free at last. See, aren't you glad that after World War II, we didn't get up, and people didn't get up and say, hey, now listen, listen, listen. This thing about prayer, this thing about putting God in the conversation about politics and law. Hey, that, we're past that now. We, we're not going to do that. I mean, we're, we're, we're too smart for that. We're, we've grown beyond that. We, you know, we, can t we just need a Congress. We just need laws. We just need a court. That's, that's what we need. Aren't you glad? Because listen, if we hadn't had a national conscience, there may have never been a civil rights movement. And aren't you glad when the founders of this country said, listen, we're going to create a nation. And what we believe and what we hold to is this idea is that we believe in a creator. Not all believe in the same way. Not all see the Bible in the same way, but we believe in a creator, and we believe he's made us all equal, person on right, person on left, and he has given us these unalienable rights, not the government, but God Almighty. I said it last week, and I'll say it again. <clears throat> it's a dangerous thing for us to say, God, <laughs> we're going to move you out of the picture. What you have done to you know, cause our national conscience to say what is the oughts and the oughts not to be. And we're going to say, God, you're going to be moved out of the picture. Because we don't know what's going to replace that. And before we know what's going to replace that, we better not move God out. The only thing that can tell us what will happen to a nation is to look at the nations around us and look at history and see what they have done before us. We cannot afford to move God out of the conversation. A politics and law, because if we do, there will be no one that we are grateful to beside us. And that leads to arrogance. And if we move God out of political conversation and out of laws, we will be accountable to no one except for us. And that will lead to more and more injustice for people. And if we continue to move God farther and farther away out of the conversation we will find again our national conscience eroding, eroding, eroding and I said it last week to the point where no longer right or wrong is determined by our hearts, it's going to be determined by a court and if the court says it's right and we think it's wrong it's still right now the most sensitive thing, here's what we can do for people that say well, I don't believe in God, and I don't want God to be part of this. All this. The most sensitive thing that we can do is to keep God in part of the conversation. Because with that, that allows people the freedom to be able to say, I don't believe in that. <laughs> I don't believe in that. It would be great, I think, if we could end political speeches with quit saying, God bless you, God bless the United States. Instead, we would say, God, we're grateful to you. And we're still accountable to you. I think in a way that would send a message to the world that we are a nation that still says we owe what we have to God. And we are accountable personally and collectively to God. So this is not the time to be afraid. It's not the time to back down. But this is the time to be bold. This is the time for us to look at the sphere of influence that we have. And to be able to interject in that any way that we can, this idea that we still believe, even though it may seem like a weird thing, an odd thing to people is, we still believe that we are grateful to God and that we are accountable to God, not only personally, but corporately. The thing that we ought to fear more than anything else is that God needs to move out of conversation completely because we don't know where that will lead us. And so I'll say to you, like I said last week, it's going to take an act of God. Pray. Continue to pray and be able to ask God, God, we need you. We need you to be a part of our national conversation. We need you to be a part of what we're trying to do. 
God, however that needs to take place. Whatever my part is individually, God, reveal that and show that to me. Let's pray.